All right, thanks, Kirsch. All right, I'm going to be preaching, continuing on in the book of Acts, and there's a couple of lessons we can learn here from Acts 13. This is the first time we see um, Paul actually preaching the gospel in the, bo uh, in the book of Acts, um, and there's something interesting there as well. But here we see in Acts 13, we start to see Paul's missionary journeys as he's preaching the gospel, and particularly him being sent out here with Saul and Barnabas. So there's three sections I want to break this chapter up into. First section is talking about Saul and Barnabas being sent out to preach the gospel. So Acts 13, 1, it says here, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So you can see here in the church in Antioch, we knew from two chapters ago, Antioch is a flourishing church, and it's flourishing because a lot of people are involved, a lot of different men preaching and edifying the church. And here as well, you see here that when they talk about certain prophets and teachers, there was a lot of different men, because this is even, this is only referring to some of them, as Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, right? And Saul was there too. So you have different men from different nationalities, even different socioeconomic classes, right? Because you see Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So he was actually brought up, childhood friends, with Herod, right? So you can see there that Menaean had, you know, potentially, you know, was a high-profile person, possibly, had links to royalty, and yet here he is, serving alongside his brothers and sisters in Christ, edifying the church. And one thing we can think about here is, you know, some people who are successful or some people that are rich, they think it's beneath them to serve God. Like it's beneath them to help clean up and do things. And they sometimes get a mindset that, oh, you know, my job is just make money and I just give to the church and then everyone else can, can labor and do all the sort of medial tasks. But you can see here, everyone's getting involved. You know, it's, you shouldn't be above serving the Lord and edifying the church and being involved just as any other church member is. And be an example uh, to the rest of the flock. So Ephesians 4.11 says here, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So you see how different aspects, different people are given to the church to build up and to perfect and to do the work of the ministry, right? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Whenever I read that verse, that just tells me, well, we just keep on doing because we'll never, we'll never reach perfection, so we're always striving to improve. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. And this is the verse I wanted to focus on here in terms of everybody coming together and playing their part to edify the church from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which, look at this, every joint supply according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So every joint, everyone plays a part in edifying the church and it's the same here in Acts 13. We have all the men, you know, preaching and edifying and it's a, it's a flourishing church. And you can see here that the church is flourishing before sending out preachers. You know, because uh, uh, in the churches that, you know, sort of we come from, you know, the practice seems to be that as soon as, you know, there's somebody ready to start a church, they're sent out to go plant a church. And oftentimes it's a, it's a large uh, hindrance to the church that sent them out. And I don't think that's always a good practice, you know, when I've been reflecting on this over the years, because a, a lot of the churches that we come from, these independent fundamental Baptist churches, they're already quite small, they're struggling. And then as soon as they have one other you know, family or one other man that can preach, they immediately send them out to go plant a church. And then that original church is now struggling again, right? 
So I think what we see here in Acts 13, the practice of, well, there is a church here that is flourishing, that is stable. And then they send out those to then go plant a new church. Whereas I feel as though today you can see a lot of churches, either they send out you know, and, and separate people up and sometimes they need to, they may have to stay together. I mean, everyone has to make that choice themselves in every church. But sometimes I see churches where, you know, they're already struggling and there's two people working together, but then now they separate up and they may have been stronger together. Or you see a church that maybe is struggling financially, but then they're sending money away to another church when the church itself could be using that money, either to pay, pay the bills or pay the preacher, right? So we don't want to separate up too much where the work is hindered in one place, but you can see here that the work is flourishing in one place. And what we learn from here is, if it's flourishing, then it, they shouldn't all stay in one place. Uh, verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. So we see here that fasting is a New Testament practice as well. It's not just an Old Testament practice. And what does fasting do? Fasting is when you don't eat for a period of time, and it's showing your earnestness to the Lord. So as they serve here, they would fast, right? When they pray, they would fast to show their earnestness to what they are seeking from God. And as they minister to the Lord, so they're serving God in the church, serving the body, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So we see here that fasting is a New Testament practice. And we also see here that the will of the Holy Ghost in Acts 13 is not that they keep all these great preachers in one place. Because you have the opposite side of the spectrum, where you have a lot of churches separating up when they you know, would be maybe better staying together. But then you have the opposite as well, where churches just stay together in one place. And they build up, and they build up these huge churches that are you know, really successful. But then you think at that point, they should be then going out and separating up to actually reach other locations and, you know, send preachers out just like they sent Barnabas and Saul out to go and preach the gospel and plant churches, right? So we should strive to grow our church, but there's always a continued effort to go out and preach the gospel and plant new churches, right? Acts 13, 4, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. So you can see, as they're going and preaching the gospel on this missionary journey, they're also going in and stopping in to synagogues, still preaching the Jews to the Jews, even though their main priority is to go and reach the Gentiles. So let's go on because I'll come back to verse 5 later on in the chapter. Now we get on to Elimus the sorcerer. Elimus the sorcerer. Acts 13, verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So we see here that this false prophet had influenced this man of stature. And he, and he was, you know, a, a well-meaning person because when he heard of Barnabas and Saul coming and preaching the word of God, he wanted to hear from them as well. So it's unfortunate that a lot of well-meaning people get caught up under the influence of false prophets. And you know, the Bible tells us about false prophets in Matthew 7.15. It says here, Beware of false prophets which come, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So you see, when a false prophet comes preaching a false gospel... They don't come looking evil. It's like in, a mo in movies, you know, when you see in movies and they always depict like Judas and he's always like a shifty looking person, dark hair, looking evil. 
And it's the same with false prophets. False prophets aren't going to be doing things evil. They're not going to... False prophets don't come in wolf's clothing. They come in sheep's clothing. So you're not always going to just notice them by the things that they do, right? The evil things that they do. That's why when people say here, you shall know them by their fruits. Well, if you just knew them by their wickedness and their, you know, their sinful acts, which is what they're trying to say what fruits are, well, then they would be having wolves' clothing, wouldn't they? But they don't. False prophets come to you in sheep's clothing. So when you look at them outwardly, what are they going to appear like? They're going to appear like righteous people. They're going to try and you know, keep the rules. They're going to, you know... But then how do you know them by their fruits? What is the fruits being referred to here in Matthew 7? It's the things that they say, right? It's the fact that Elymas was trying to turn... Um, um, what was his name again? Uh, turn Sergius Paulus, right? Away from the faith, right? That's how they know he was a false prophet, not necessarily from his outward appearance, because false prophets will come to you in sheep's clothing. And that's something always to keep in mind, you know, when you listen to preachers online and all that. You know, people might be teaching a false gospel, they might be saying false things, but how do you know they're a false prophet? It's not necessarily how they present themselves. Right? Or how eloquent they are. It's by the things that they say. That's why it's so important that you know the Word of God. Because a lot of, like I said, a lot of well meaning people are just trying to learn the Word of God, like Sergius Paulus here. You know, he wanted to just hear the Word of God. He wanted to learn more, but he got caught up by Elimus the sorcerer, a false prophet. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. See, a lot of people use this passage to try and prove a person's salvation, but it's, it's not a good thing to do because the Bible says here, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So you see here that this is not about whether you sin or not as a Christian. Because if you sin as a Christian, and, and people say the fruit is oh, you know, whether you're sinning or not, well, this is saying here a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. So if that was the case, then it would just condemn everybody. Because everybody who believes on Jesus Christ is a sinner. But what's the good tree? The good tree is the new man. The good tree brings forth good fruit because the, good man, the new man confesses Jesus Christ as Saviour. Right? This is, what, this is uh, how this can be applied. But what it's actually talking about in, the, in the, the first instance is how do you know a false prophet? How do you know a false prophet? Because of the things that they say. Right? They're preaching a false gospel, like Elymas the sorcerer. Every tree that bringeth forth not, uh, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Right, so Elymas the sorcerer. So Saul now confronts Elymas the sorcerer. Right? Then Saul, who also is called Paul. So I think it's interesting here that you have Saul now rebuking a false prophet. And in, in verse 9, this is the first time Saul is actually referred to as Paul. And then from this moment onward in the book of Acts, he's just referred to Paul from this moment onwards. So nobody really knows why his, cha his name changed from Saul to Paul. But at this point where he rebukes Elymas the sorcerer, it says, then Saul, who is also called Paul, and from this moment he's just called Paul uh, throughout the Bible and in all, obviously the epistles as well. Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So he rebukes Elymas and brings blindness upon him. Right? So Elymas actually loses his sight through Paul's rebuke. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, one thing I want to say here about Saul, who's now referred to as Paul, is, of course, the Christian life 
should be defined by charity, right? By love, by trying to do good to other people. But like I've preached in the past, this doesn't mean that we are just a, a mat to be walked over. That there isn't a time to say negative things. That there isn't a time, you know, it doesn't, being a Christian doesn't mean you're nice all the time. That there is times to rebuke. And like we see here, when Paul rebukes Elymas the sorcerer, he's doing the right thing. Now some people might, you know, see how, you know, uh, Paul reacts and be like, well, you know, nowadays you'd think if a Christian reacted this way to a false prophet, that people would be like, oh, that's not a very Christian thing to do. But Paul, being a great example, you can see here that there are times sometimes when rebuke needs to be given where Christians need to stand up against false things, right? Where they need to say sometimes negative things in order to stand up for what is right, just like Paul is doing here. But you need to know when is the right time to do this. But there is sometimes a time to do it. Look at what Paul says in Galatians 1.8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So preaching a false gospel is no small thing, right? And this is Paul teaching through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost his attitude on false gospels and false prophets, right? Let's look at some stern words from John the Baptist. John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? People might say, well, John, that's not a very Christian thing to say. Well, you can see here, well, when it comes to certain individuals, and, and namely the religious leaders, people that are promoting a false gospel, people that are leaders in false agendas, they are fair game, right, to go after, right? And Christians should be standing up against these things and speaking against these things. Matthew 23, 27. Look at how Jesus addressed the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23. I'm just taking a small chunk from Matthew 23. But if you read the whole chapter, this is just Jesus just, you know, rebuking and, uh, you know, uh, reproving the scribes and the Pharisees for a lot of the things that they did and the false things that they believed. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. So can you imagine if somebody said that to you? I mean, this is not a nice thing to say. Right? In the sense of, you know, it's not something pleasant to say to somebody, but Jesus is saying it to people that are leaders, that are leading people astray and calling them out. He says, hypocrite. He's saying, you look good on the outside, but inward you are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garner, garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. See how he's calling them out for their inconsistency. You know, they say, well, we would not have you know, martyred the prophets in the past and yet they want people dead today that are speaking out against them. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So these words came from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't get the impression here that Christians are weak, that Christians don't stand up for what is right, that Christians won't rebuke what is evil. Right? and take a stand. Jesus did. But what, where the unbalance is, let me tell you where the unbalance is, is where young Christians will take verses like this and they will just apply this attitude to just 
any unbeliever that just believes something false. Right? So this is where it's, it's, it's incorrect to do that. Right? Because you want some grace with people that may not know the truth, may not understand the truth, they may, have, you know, they may be in ignorance. Right? So sometimes I've seen, you know, you go, you go out soul winning, you know, you just have like an ignorant unbeliever just at the door, just, just disputing, asking questions. And then you have young Christians just like rebuking them and they're saying, look, ah, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we need to have it in the right place. What is the right place? Well, you can see here, Paul in Acts 13, he's rebuking a false prophet who is misleading people astray. Right? Same with John the Baptist. He's rebuking the religious leader. Jesus is rebuking religious leaders. So these are people that are not acting in ignorance. Right? They are up. They are teaching people. You know, they are, you know, there to be rebuked if they are preaching the wrong thing. Just as um, John the Baptist, Jesus did, and Paul did in Acts 13. Titus 1.10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Right? So... Sharp rebuke is not, not directed at the unbeliever with false doctrines, but the religious leader that is leading people astray. Right? So, a couple of lessons from this section is you know, we need to make sure we know God's word so that we're not taken by false teaching. So we don't have an Elymas the sorcerer in our life that is turning us away from the things of the Lord and we're well-meaning. You know, We want to learn more and... Nowadays, it's not Ellie Mr. Sorcerer. Now it's Ellie Mr. on the YouTube channel, right? So you, you go on, you search on YouTube, and you're just listening to people, and you may be well-meaning and trying to learn things. But if you don't know the Bible yourself, you know, you may have somebody turning you away from the truth as opposed to teaching you the right things. You need to be very careful. And the other thing from this part of the chapter is, hey, being Christian doesn't mean you have to tolerate all views. You know, there is... False teaching, and sometimes false teaching needs to be resisted and rebuked, like we see Paul here. Maybe that's why Paul, you know, Saul's name changed to Paul. He just leveled up <laughs> in, his, uh, in his rebuke. Now, the last part of the chapter we want to talk about is Paul's preaching. So what I think is interesting here is up until this point, we've heard preaching from Peter. We saw Peter go and preach to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. But up until this point, we've heard about the great things that Paul has been doing amongst the Gentiles and, and reaching the Jews and, and all sorts of things. Barnabas brought him along when they had the church at Antioch, and the church in Antioch is flourishing. But Acts 13 is the first time we actually see what Paul is preaching, and it's a powerful sermon in Acts 13. Just, and his preaching is very similar to the Apostle Peter. Acts 13, 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. So you may think when you read this that when they travel, they're coming back to Antioch. But the reason why it says here Antioch and Pisidia is because just like we have, you know, there's a Liverpool here where we are, there's like a Liverpool in the UK and there's a Liverpool, I found out, in New York as well. There's, you know, places that have the same name but are in different places. So it's the same here. There's Antioch in Pisidia, which is different to the Antioch church, which we learned about in Acts 11. They came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So even as they're going and they're preaching the gospel and they're on these missionary journeys, they're still stopping in at the synagogue to try and preach to their brethren, the Jews, because we know from Paul's epistles he had a big heart to reach his brethren. You know, he even had a burden that he wished that he could go to hell for his brethren's sake if that were possible. So they're going along 
preaching the gospel and they're stopping in at the synagogues as well. And here they stop in at the synagogue in another city called Antioch, but in Pisidia, as opposed to where they are, which is in Syria. So, like I said, this is the first time we see Paul preaching. And he goes into this synagogue and they give him an opportunity to address the people. Now, this was a practice they had. It seems as though if they sat in certain areas in the synagogue, they were given this opportunity to preach because that's where the teachers sat. But maybe after this instance, they may rethink that practice because obviously there was a big disagreement after Paul went and preached Jesus Christ. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. So similar to when uh, Stephen was preaching in Acts chapter 7, right? He starts giving a history of how, you know, Israel, you know, the history of Israel and, you know, the, the coming Messiah. So you can see here that the approach is the same when they are preaching to the Jews as they give this history of, hey, there was this promise given to the fathers. Jesus is fulfilling that promise. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. So we see here them exodus coming out of Egypt and then spending 40 years in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he delivered their land to them by lot. So this is referring to Joshua leading them into the promised land, the wars that went on, and then dividing up the land and the spoils there as their inheritance and setting up the, the nation of Israel in the land of Canaan. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Right? So the prophets throughout the Bible up until Samuel when they were given the king, King Saul. And afterward, they desired a king and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. So that was the first king of Israel by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a saviour, Jesus. So why is this significant? Because the Jews would have known very well the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the promises eventually going to, you know, being taken away from Saul and then given to David, and that the Saviour, Jesus Christ, would be of the seed of David. Right? So what he's telling them here is, you know, these promises that God had made to us that Christ would be raised of the seed of David. This is Jesus, whom ye crucify. Now, how did they know that the Christ would be of the seed of David? Well, if you go to 2 Samuel 7, this is when, if you remember that story, David wanted to build a house for God, but God didn't want him to build a house. God said, hey, I'm going to build your house, and, your, and thy seed is going to reign there. That was referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So if you remember, David thought he was referring to Solomon, because he ended up getting all the equipment together, getting Solomon to build the house. But no, God was referring to Jesus Christ, who would be raised up of the seed of David. He would descend from David's line. And this is why Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah. All right, Acts 13, 24. Let's continue. <laughs> when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. So now he's getting to the fact that they rejected the preaching from John the Baptist and the prophets before them. So what was John the Baptist's message of the baptism of repentance? Well, we know from Acts 19.4. 
Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So the same message that Paul is preaching now. So they rejected, you know, John the Baptist's preaching, and John the Baptist was preaching about the coming Messiah that would come after him, you know, whose shoes he was not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Right? Because Jesus came to the Jews first. Now, you know, the gospel is getting out to the Gentiles. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So see, in rejecting John the Baptist's message, in rejecting what the prophets preached and what the prophets wrote, they ended up fulfilling what the prophets actually wrote about in condemning and crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. So it's like what Paul talks about, or what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. You know, the gospel is how that Christ died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. This is what Paul is saying here. The, the way they killed Jesus was according to what was fulfilled, uh, what was prophesied about in the, in the Old Testament. This is what he's showing the Jews here. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up from him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So he's showing how in the Psalms these prophecies were fulfilled. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So what is interesting here is that he's referring to the same Psalm that Peter refers to in Acts chapter 2 and in other times he preaches as well. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So what is that referring to? The fact that Jesus was buried and his body didn't rot, right? Because he was only there for three days and three nights. He rose again. So he's saying that David is not talking about himself. David was prophesying about the Lord Jesus Christ. But David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. So we see there, like we talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, that he died according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it's not that Jesus just died and was buried and rose again. He actually did it according to what was prophesied in the Old Testament. That's what makes it just another degree of just being amazing in terms of what Jesus did. Acts 13, this is the conclusion. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. So Paul makes it very clear. Salvation is by grace alone. That it's not by keeping works. right? By grace alone, through faith alone. And this is the same preaching that Peter did in Acts chapter 2. Now, why is this significant? Because I won't spend it, because we know Paul's message is salvation by grace. We know he's, you know, talking about the history of Israel and Jesus being crucified, and this is what they're rejecting, right? So I don't want to spend too much time there. But one thing I want to point out here is, you know, a lot of, an objection sometimes you get, especially from the Muslims, they will say something like, you know, Christianity is just what Paul made Christianity. It wasn't what Jesus was preaching. It wasn't what Jesus' apostles were preaching. They preached, you know, the Muslims will say to you, they preached Islam, they preached one God, but then 
Paul came along and then just changed Christianity and then the Christianity is today, the Christians are just following Paul, but they're not following Jesus. But what, one thing that you'll notice here in Acts chapter 13 is what Paul is preaching is exactly what Peter was preaching, right? When Peter preached to the Gentiles as well, he gave, you know, and to the Jews, he gave a summary of Israel. Stephen gave a summary of Israel saying, hey, you know, you guys rejected what God was prophesying. Jesus fulfills that prophecy and you get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, that's where Peter, remember, that's where he preached up to you and then the Holy Ghost fell on all the Gentiles. They started speaking with tongues. So what Peter was preaching is the same as what Paul is preaching. And what is interesting here is when Paul went on this missionary journey with Saul and Barnabas, look who was with him. And they had also John to their minister. So this idea that the apostles were preaching something different to Paul and Paul had a different message and the apostles had a different message to Paul is completely false because they worked together. They were laboring in the gospel together just like John was traveling here with Paul. And you see here in verse 13, it says, after Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So not until they came to Pamphylia, John then went back to Jerusalem. Right? So you can see here that the apostles are working very closely with Paul. Right? And they knew that Paul was of the Lord, because in 2 Peter 3, Peter actually refers to Paul's writings as scriptures. Verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So have you ever come across that objection? You know, that Paul is... You know, took Christianity in another direction. Paul had a different message to Jesus and the apostles. You can show them verses like this where you can see, hey, what Paul preached. This is why it's interesting to see what Paul preached in Acts chapter 13. Because you see that his message is exactly the same as Peter's message. Same as Stephen's message. Same as, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we see here them working together. Acts 13, 4. Let's continue. And we'll finish off this chapter. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. So he is warning them not to reject the gospel, like they, you know, they rejected John's preaching and everything, and not to become like what was prophesied in Habakkuk 1.5. This is where this uh, verse comes from. Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. Verse 42, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So after the congregation kind of breaks up, the Gentiles say, hey, we want to hear these words again next week. Right? We want to hear more about this. And some of the Jews, you know, so many of them, but not all of them, kind of went along and Paul and Barnabas separately from the congregation is trying to encourage them to continue in the grace of God and not, you know, trust the works to get them to heaven. Acts 13, 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles." So the Gentiles are especially receptive to the gospel. They want to hear more the next Sabbath day. But the Jews were so unhappy with the message of salvation because Jesus was ma effectively making the Gentiles equal with the Jews, right? That they spoke against Paul. They just disregarded the truth. And sometimes, you know, people, they, they get so caught up in the things that they want to hold to that they, 
You know, it says here, they're not only going against what, Jesus, uh, what Paul is preaching, but they are blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, they are blaspheming, like rejecting that he is who he said he is. But Paul says here it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Why? Because the, the gospel was preached first to the Jews. Like in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So yes, they tried to preach the gospel to the Jews, but when the Jews rejected it, they moved on to those that were more receptive. And we can take that same practice where, you know, we want to try and give the gospel to everyone, but you want to spend most of your time where people are receptive. You know, I, and I've been guilty of this too, you know, sometimes you're arguing with somebody about the gospel and you end up spending more time arguing with somebody that's not listening to what you're saying and responding. They're just disputing everything that you're saying. They don't really want to hear it. They're not listening. And we don't want to spend too much time with those people. We want to spend time with people that are actually trying to seek answers and actually trying to learn. And they may have objections, but they're taking on what you are saying. Right? Verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So what Paul is referring to here is a prophecy in Isaiah 49.6 where it says the Jews, the nation of Israel, would be a light to the Gentiles and they would be used to get the gospel to them. And he said, it is, a it is, is it a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So I've touched on this verse before, but I thought I'd just mention it here. And this is probably the trickiest verse when it comes to disputing Calvinism, right? So Calvinism is the idea that God chooses beforehand who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And a lot of Calvinists will use this verse to see, say like, ah, oh, see, only the people that were foreordained before the foundation of the world believed the gospel, right? So I don't think this is what it says. I think the easy explanation is that there were people that were already saved, right? Because the Gentiles, there were, there were believers amongst the Gentiles as well. So it's not that there were only believers amongst the Jews, there were believers amongst the Gentiles as well. But when it says here that they believed, they didn't necessarily get saved, right? They believed the, the message of Jesus Christ, right? Because they didn't, they may not have, they weren't in Jerusalem. They didn't see all these things happen. They didn't know how the scriptures were going to be fulfilled. So they're hearing this and they're believing the testimony of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus Christ is that Messiah that they were looking forward to as believing Gentiles, right? So this is not saying as many as were foreordained before the foundation of the world. I think this is, all this is saying is that there were believers there, that they're saved, they're ordained to eternal life because they're saved and they're believing what Paul is preaching, right, about Jesus Christ. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honourable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. See, this situation here reminds me of what is happening today, where people do not engage in civil discourse and they can't necessarily go against what is being said, so they will just shut people down, right? This woke cancel culture that just wants to censor people and take them off the platforms you can see nothing new is under the sun. They didn't like what they were saying. They were losing the, the, you know, the, you know, people wanted to hear them more than they wanted to hear somebody else. So rather than argue in the battle of ideas, they just wanted to censor them and shut them down, right? So they stirred up the leaders there to just cast them out of the city. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So they had the right mindset, didn't they? When they were persecuted for righteousness' sake, they were joyful, just like we see in Acts 5.42, right? In Acts 5. So, in conclusion, right, what are some lessons? 
One is, we saw at the beginning of the chapter, you know, all men should strive to edify the church. We saw in the church in Antioch, you know, there was a lot of men preaching, different nationalities, different socioeconomic classes, but they all came together to edify the church, no matter what stature you are. Another one, another lesson. You know, we should always have a heart to reach more souls. You know, we don't want to unnecessarily divide up the church and, and weaken, you know, two churches. But when a church gets to the size where it's flourishing, there should always be a desire to want to go and plant another church, go start another ministry, reach more people. Number three, we need to make sure we know God's word. You don't want to be caught up with an LMS the sorcerer, right? And today, it doesn't come through like a sorcerer. It's going to come to you online. It's going to come to you through YouTube and the shorts and things like that. And you think, hey, well, this guy's got some good stuff to say. But if you don't know the Bible, you don't know God's word, you may be learning a lot of stuff that is wrong. So you need to, be, you need to take care of that. Be, be aware of that. Number four, being a Christian doesn't mean you have to tolerate all views and just be nice all the time. There are times where we need to rebuke and resist and go against false teaching. Right? Number five, we see here that Paul preached the same gospel as Peter did. So if you ever come across this objection, Paul, you know, Christians are just following Paul. You know, if you know different passages you can take them to, you can show them. No, Paul preached the same thing and he actually worked very closely with the apostles. And the last two points, you know, hey, we need to attempt to give the gospel to everyone, but we should try and spend time most with people that are the most receptive. And if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, hey, take joy knowing that if you are being persecuted, you may be doing something right. Because the Bible says, yea, and all that shall live godly shall suffer persecution. All right? So hopefully you learned something from Acts chapter 13. Let's uh, pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and uh, thank you for the example of the apostles and uh, we pray, Lord, that you would use us, use us to be a powerful preacher of the gospel like Paul and I pray, Lord, that you give us a heart to want to reach souls. Lord, help us to have that right balance between grace and truth. Help us to be bold in standing up against the false things of this world. Help us to know your word so that we aren't carried away by every wind of doctrine and false prophets that are out there. So we thank you, Lord. Uh, we thank you that we have your word to study. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.